Bienvenidos y bien, bien, bueno, bienvenidas en este caso no, no tenemos presentes aquí. Uh, I will switch into English. Uh, very welcome to this uh, Transgang training seminar, a new Transgang training seminar of the research project Transgang. I hope uh, that everybody who was interested in the seminar, who is interested in the seminar, could connect um, by, by, the, by the link we, we sent you. Um, I will briefly uh, explain to you uh, what we will talk about uh, today and the speakers we have here today present. Um, my name is Nela Hansen. I'm the project manager of the Transgang project. And I think uh, today we are many members of the research team and other colleagues that know well the, the research project. But the tra Transgang project is about uh, analyzing and inter interpreting youth street groups in a transnational comparison. So we focus on the Latin American continent, uh, the north of Africa and the south of Europe, um, as I said, in a transnational comparison. And within this analysis, uh, we, we have a special interest, uh, interest in the processes and experiences of mediation, which is the subject of this uh, seminar today the mediation and public, public policies in the Transgang project. And um, if you, um, the Transgang training seminars are a, a regular activity we offer here at the University Pompeo Fabra. This is the first virtual seminar that we offer in the streaming version. We hope that technically everything uh, work out fine. Um, if you go to the web page of the Transgang project, which is the, you see the, um, here, I hope you can see on the, on the screen. Um, if you go to activities here and the first Transgang training seminar, so you will have like a, all the forthcoming training seminars that we will offer this year. So um, we hope that you, that you're interested in the following training seminars as well. And these training seminars are considered to be a, um, a space for the exchange between the Transgang researchers and, and the uh, subjects that matter for the research project, but not only for our team members, but also for other academics, researchers, uh, colleagues, and stakeholders that are interested in the, in the subjects and the, of, the, of the research project. So we are really happy today that we have uh, experts on the, on the uh, matter of mediation and public policies. So um, um, our uh, Transgang researcher, Adam Brisley, um, will present uh, more, more or less theoretical background of mediation and um, the combination with the ethics of care, um, which is a quite interesting focus. And Adam is a social anthropologist, um, and his, his research interests center on the relation between, between care and political economy. Um, as I said, he, he's a team member of, uh, trans, of the Transgang project. And here he's in charge of the project's data management, ethics, and safety protocols. But he also works um, as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bristol. Um, on a project that analyzes the circulation of anti antibiotics in Barcelona during an ongoing crisis of care. On, and after this, we, we are happy that um, we have here with us uh, Jorge Rodriguez Menes, who will comment on, on the presentation on, of Adam. Um, he has a PhD in sociology from the North American University of Northwestern. And he's currently a Sarah Hunter Associate Professor at here at the Pompeo Fabra University, where he's also the coordinator of the doctoral program of the Department of Political and Social Science. And um, uh, now, after, after me, um, Jose Sanchez, our team member of the Transgang project, will give us a brief intro introduction into the, into the matter of uh, mediation and pu public policies. He uh, holds a PhD in social and cultural anthropology, and he's the scientific coordinator of the Transgang project and also the ethnographic coordinator of the, um, all the North African field work uh, in, in Transgang. 
So we, after I will give the word to, to Jose for a brief introduction, then we will have the presentation of Adam Brisley, and then we will, um, sorry, then Jorge Rodriguez will comment on, on, the, on the reflections um, before. And after, at the, at the final part of the session, we will have time like 30 or 40 minutes for questions, if you have any questions, doubts, or comments you would like to make. And for this, as it is a streaming um, session, we all would like, we would invite you to send us these questions or com comments to the email address transgang at upf.edu. So uh, during the session, if you have any questions or comments, please send it to us and then afterwards we will collect these questions and comments and we will, we will discuss it together. So thank you very much for, for being in the session and now I will give the word to, to Jose. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to this session of the first uh, the first session of the training, uh, trans and training seminars of this course, 2021. The idea is that we can share our knowledges and our experiences related with the uh, issues and topics of the, in, in the project. It's very important that we start with this kind of session uh, because in the, in the Transgam project, mediation is a key and a central theme and a key point in the, in the research program. Our objective in, the, in this workshop for, uh, is discussing the theoretical perspective of mediation adopted in Transgan project and share our, uh, our objectives and methodologies to implement during the fieldwork period to obtain significant data to analyze the ways of process of mediation uh, related to youth street groups or gangs. Um, uh, this, uh, the starting point is about the definition of mediation in, in Transgam project. In our uh, concept paper, we construct uh, an operational definition, mainly elaborated by our researcher in Madrid, Maria Oliver, that includes techniques used for conflict resolutions, both formal and informal, used in gang relations. According to our priority in our fieldwork, is to find forms of mediation that use youth culture languages. This means music, dance, art, media, performance, sport, and other daily activities, activities experienced by young people. Some of these techniques are internal to the group itself, but others need the participation of other social actors, including other gang leaders and members, social workers, police, media, NGOs, or political representative. Our aim in the project is proof that gangs and gang members of youth street groups have been and could be agents of mediation, learning from successful experiences, but also researching the barriers and failures in this process. Other important question to, uh, to research uh, mediation processes in 12 cities in three continents is the idea that to take into in consideration the cultural backgrounds, uh, to, to avoid uh, some kind of uh, colonization from the Western experiences in mediation. So we must consider the cultural differences of project locations and how to include these specificities in our analysis. A good example is the case of mediation processes in Maghribian societies. Mediation, mediation, uh, sulh in classic Arabic, refers to an agreement on a property dispute. In customary law, it means a solution to an enmity. In general terms, it reflects a sense of conflict resolution through a mediation processes. The two parties select individuals respected and legitimated by the community to mediate the conflict, declaring a ceasefire. The goal is to arrive at an agreement that maintains the honor and status of both parties, 
When it's obtained, a public ritual is performed for heat sealing. Particularly important, an important difference with the Western mediation processes among others, is the fact that the practices reinforce links between groups and not only between individuals, avoiding a cycle of revenge because the conflict always are related with collectives, not individuals. This is a very important difference with the uh, mediation processes in Western societies because they are related to individuals, not, not exactly with groups. Finally, as a third key point, we cannot forget that we are trans researchers. We are not social workers or mediators, but rather ethnographers. Because of this, the main aim of the workshop is share the toolkit for the researchers involved in the fieldwork to evaluate mediation processes, considering the local cultural frameworks that establish traditional ways of mediating in each region, as the case of Arabic, uh, uh, Arabic cultural device is uh, represent. So now is the time that Adam Brisley, our ethical and mediation researcher, shared with us how we work on the question of mediation and how will we conduct uh, mm, how we'll conduct uh, to, to, uh, to extract data for our, our field, uh, our locations, uh, and, and the guide to analyze this empirical data in a general manner. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm going to speak um, about mediation in the context of the, of the trans gang project. Um, when we speak about gangs, the concept of gangs within trans gang, we really use it as a very broad definition to incorporate a whole range of different groups um, that organize in the street. So youth groups are organized in the street. The only real set of groups that the definition excludes are mafia type organizations, so organizations whose sole purpose is, is, to, is to engage in criminal activity. When we talk about mediation within, within the, the trans gang project, or when we started to try and, what, no, 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 it's, 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 <laughs> um, when we started to try and define what mediation meant, we also needed to broaden the definition. So the work that I'm going to present here is not a discussion of academic work on mediation, of which there is a lot, and as, as Jose said, we've covered this within the trans gang concept paper. What I'm gonna to try to do here is to use contemporary debates within the anthropology of care and within the anthropology of uh, ethics and morality to help to broaden out the definition of mediation in a way that enables us to capture the experiences, the informal experiences of, of, okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, so what is, is that better? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so what I'm trying to, so what I'm going to do to here is to explain how we can think about mediation via concepts that have been taken from the anthropology of care and from the anthropology of ethics and morality. Um, so before I do that, I'll speak about the, the, the um, objectives of the, of the project. So the mediate, mediation part of the project, the primary aim of the mediation experiences project is to develop a white paper of recommendations for practitioners and policy makers. To achieve this, the project has three secondary objectives. One, to conduct a scoping exercise of governmental responses to gang conflict mediation in the 12 trans gang field sites. Two, to collect ethnographic materials concerning informal and institutionally led mediation experiences from across the trans gang data set and to conduct additional field work around emergent examples of mediation. And three, to develop a critical perspective on gang conflict mediation by situating policies and practices in a broader political and socioeconomic context. So to start with, 
um, the scholarly work of, 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 of mediation practitioners, it's often written by, um, or, or, or the scholarly work on mediation is often written by mediation practitioners. So, so people like social workers, community workers, um, and teachers who have experience in, in conflict mediation and then, and then report their findings uh, in academic journals. And what they tend to discuss is, is, is are common examples of mediation, practical strategies for other, for other practitioners to copy. So an apparently common model of mediation involves bringing opposing groups together, often within a school or other neutral space, to discuss their issues of disagreement. Many authors emphasize the need for participation to be voluntary, for mediators to take a neutral stance during proceedings, and for a relationship of trust to be established between mediators and all those involved in the intervention. Now, from an anthropological perspective, the scholarly work of conflict mediation practitioners can be critiqued for failing to adequately account for the strong statistical association between urban violence, poverty, and inequality. They tend to focus very narrowly, so mediation practitioners, their experience is in directly in empirical mediations in the community, and so they tend to focus on a very narrow set of actors, gangs and gangsters, primarily. And what this does is it, it tends to ignore the structural determinants of violence and risk giving the impression that gun conflict can be understood as a result of actions and decisions of key individuals, rather than as a total social phenomenon for which we all have some form of responsibility via relations of poverty, via structural inequality, and so on and so on. So, for example, I think this was for me, this was for me the, the, the most... Uh, provocative, extreme example of, of this kind of, what I would argue is a kind of neoliberal thinking about gang conflict mediation. So in an article which was published in the Journal of, of Conflict and Terrorism, Studies of Conflict and Terror Terrorism. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I'm, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Can you continue? <laughs> it's because I can't remember. Um, uh, so they, so in, in their article of Conflict and Terrorism, Raman and, and Vukovic um, assert that security is an essential public good. So, uh, so initially we're already starting with these kinds of mor normative moral assumptions as the framework for understanding uh, gang conflict mediation. And they claim that gang conflicts is among the leading causes of violent deaths in the, in the Western Hemisphere. I, <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine that that particular claim is true if you consider gender and sexual violence. <laughs> so, but they, they, don't, they don't explore this. Um, but then, be, at the same time, however, within, within the, the scholarly work of mediation practitioners, there are examples that don't follow this kind of neoliberal logic. So they don't get engaged with this kind of moral absolutism of, of, uh, of, of Vukovic and others. So, for example, um, Liderak's work uh, highlights the temp temporary and fragile nature of conflict mediation processes. And similarly, uh, Sergi et al., who described gang me mediation as a process of reconstructing the relationship bonds of the community and displacing the perceptions of social danger. So within the work of, of uh, Lederach and, and Sergi, Ser Segri, in Segri, you see an alternative model of understanding uh, mediation that isn't that, that doesn't try to um, that doesn't assume that, that, that gang formation is a, an axiomatic social problem and, and and so on and so on and instead tries to understand why these conflicts emerge and how and, and what what is the social significance of resolving these conflicts these kinds of examples what I would call a kind of informal mediation are really what I think the mediation experiences project is intends to capture. We can easily capture gang prevention strategies via analysis of, of, of policies and policy frameworks. What we can do ethnographically is to look at how mediation happens on the ground. So these probably won't be large coordinated projects in order to, to manage the relationships between two very discrete gangs. What we're talking about is the everyday mediation work that gang members do, that people do within their communities. Now, I'm going to move on now to speak about the ethics of care as it's defined within medical anthropology. The reason that I'm speaking about care in relation to gang conflict mediation is because I believe that some of the, the ethnographic examples of informal mediation practices probably could be analyzed 
via a framework which, which, which emphasizes the, the inherent logics within them, and it's my hypothesis, so to speak, that we can think about them as examples of, of care. So first of all, I'll explain what I mean by the concept of care. I take the concept of care from the work of Anne-Marie Moll, who is a, a, Dutch, um, a Dutch philosopher, but who uses ethnography almost exclusively within her work. Um, and she, has, she wrote in 2008 a book called The Logic of Care. Her focus is, her ethnographic focus is in clinics, in diabetes clinics, but her work has been, um, her, her understanding, her model of care has been applied to a, a broad range of different fields of practice, including telehealth in Catalonia and, and cancer care in Manchester. So what does Moll mean by empirical ethics? What Moll means by ethics is not an abstract set of principles that are applied to the real world, such as in the case with formal research ethics, for example, but quite the opposite. Moll is interested in empirical ethics, in how ethical notions, notions of good and bad, better or, and worse, emerge from doing particular practical things, such as trying to work out the desirable dietary regime of a diabetic patient during a nursing consultation. The good and bad of such an activity are not abstract principles that are applied to the real world, but qualities that emerge from trial and error. The ethnography of empirical ethics is not about putting theory into practice, but about putting practice into theory. Um, what does, so Moll takes this idea that, that, that human action made visible ethnographically often follows particular ideas of good and bad. These, good, these ideas of good and bad are not necessarily philosophical concepts that are applied to the real world in order to guide action, but emerge from the practice itself. So if you're trying to work out what is the best dietary regime for a diabetic patient, it doesn't tell you in a medical textbook. You have to work out what does that patient want to do with their body. If they want to be more active, perhaps one regime is better. If they want to be more secure, perhaps another one. If they want to reduce their insulin, perhaps another one. So the good and bad within that practice emerge from the practice itself. They're not abstract principles that are applied to practice, but they emerge from practice. My idea is that we can think about gang conflict mediation in a similar kind of way. So the ethics of care. In care, the aim is not to give a patient what they want, because this is seldom possible. Instead, aims have to be decided in relation to what is possible. And as time moves forward in the care of individual patients, possibilities and what is considered desirable will necessarily change. For example, it may sometimes be the case that working to support the autonomy of a patient is considered the best thing to do. But at other times, autonomy may be seen as less important than comfort, safety, support, eating a more enjoyable diet, or any number of other concerns that may emerge in the course of events. Her point is that the good and the bad that guide the process, that, that guide the process of care emerge in, relation, in relation, emerge in the relationship between caregiver and patient and continually change. So, how does this apply to gang mediation? Well, it's, it's, it, it, it's my suggestion that the enduring interpersonal relationships that, that, that the work of people like Lederach um, imply means that we can think about it as enacting what one Moll would call an ethics of care. Because care goes back and forth in an ongoing process, so the, the nurse does something that has an effect on the patient's body, the patient responds, perhaps the aims change, and so on and so on. Because it, 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 goes, back in an, it goes back and forth in an ongoing process, it, it implies a continuing commitment from the carer and, in professionalized settings, a continuing resource commi commitment from the care provider. Similarly, in Lederach's work, the notion that mediation processes are forever unfinished implies a long-term relationship that changes and undulates with the passing of time. It is this long-termism that is of particular interest to the Mediation Experiences Project as it provides a counterweight to the neoliberal idea that social problems can be addressed with quick-fix policy solutions. So, to, to try and clarify it a little bit, what, what I'm trying to suggest is that the, the poli there, is a, there is an intrinsic, there is an implicit idea within gang mediation policy that, that the intervention will be a one-time thing. There is a conflict with a gang, you go into that conflict, you mediate that conflict, you leave and everything's okay. 
what Lederach's work and others suggest is that this process needs to continually happen. There is not an end point, that it's a continual process of mediation. That it doesn't have one particular end, that you require, that, that if you're going to mediate in a, in a, in a, between groups within a community that, that's, that's extremely marginalized and so on, that work has to be ongoing. It need, that mediation is not a product, it's not a policy solution, it's a, it's, it's a new social process that you enact effectively. It's very similar, in my view, to, to how care functions. Care is not a medical intervention. Care is a process that's ongoing, that changes as we change, as our bodies change. So that's the analogy that I'm trying to draw between care and mediation. Why I think it's an important analogy to be drawn, I'll, I'll address uh, now in, in, in the third section. So part three, care and capitalism. Moll's work provides us with a valuable set of tools for identifying and understanding care practices on an everyday ethnographic level. But we should not view care as something that exists outside the mainstream of economic and cultural praxis. On the contrary, the category of care came into being during the same great process of social transformation that gave rise to capitalism. Put too simply, for men to be free to sell their labor in the new factories of the Industrial Revolution, they first had to be detached from the networks of social obligation in which they were embedded. The category of care, or women's work, emerged as a demarcation for the social labor that this process excluded, namely child rearing, family, community maintenance and education, and caring for the sick and elderly. To capital, To capital, domestic care represented a convenient sphere of so, so domestic care. I mean, I mean the the um, the work the work that that, that, that women did within the home um, in, in, during a period that they were excluded from the workplace. Or not, not not everyone was excluded, but the majority of women were excluded from the workplace. Domestic care represented a convenient sphere of, of social activity onto which the real costs of maintaining a workforce could be externalised. Following the Second World War, in many European countries, as elsewhere, care became an increasingly strict state-led activity as a new social democratic consensus took hold and national governments introduced uh, pu publicly funded health and, and care systems and other welfare provisions. This continued until around the 1970s when the perceived failings of public funding models helped usher in an era of fiscal discipline, outsourcing and the rolling back of universal public services. The result is that national populations in many European countries are now facing crises of care as they deal, in, as they deal with the seemingly intractable, intractable problem of determining who, in the absence of adequate welfare provision or an unpaid domestic labor force, does the actual care work. As Nancy Fraser puts it, no society that systematically undermines social reproduction can endure for long. Today, however, a new form of capitalist society is doing just that. So, in the final part of the, uh, of the, of the um, literature section, I guess, uh, I'll, I'll try, I'm going to try and bring this back now to the question of, of gang mediation. So, to, to return to the question of gang conflict mediation then, what I'm suggesting is that models of social intervention, such as mediation and gang prevention, should be viewed in the context of broader transformations to the global political economy and the effects that such processes have on the abilities of governments and communities to provide for the basic needs of their population. So if I'm saying that care is something intrinsic to human relationships that was via a historic process abstracted, called women's work, then women entered the labor market the state takes some of the responsibility for care. Then the state relinquishes its responsibility for care. Then the question is, who does this care work? And I think you can explain a lot of social tensions via this concept of a crisis of care. It's a contradiction of care, as Nancy Fraser says. To bring this back to gang conflict mediation, I think that what mediation is doing, and this is really the hypothesis, I guess, of, of the project, what mediation is doing is filling the void left by, by basic forms of care and sociality. And so when you have a mediating agency going into a community or, or, or a mediating agency emerging within the community, the reason that that work has to be ongoing is because of the injury caused by a lack of ability to care for themselves or to care for each other is ongoing. Um, so gang mediation strategies, including those described by scholars like Rahman and Vukovic, 
can be seen as palliatives for such problems, that is, ways of addressing symptoms without dealing with root causes. Mediation strategies that seek to go further, however, so when I say mediation strategies that seek to go further, I mean, I mean these informal processes, these community-based processes, that seek to reconstruct the relationship bonds of the community and displace the perception of social danger are, are of a different order. By helping, to, by helping to reconstitute community ties, mediation strategies that embody an ethics of care can be viewed as a form of resistance to historic processes of social dislocation. And so it, these, it is those kinds of examples that, that, that really we're interested in capturing, that, that try to restore via mediation processes, not only to, that try to address violence, but also try to restore dignity between the groups, that try to restore some sense of community, which I think is where a lot of this, this, this conflict probably ultimately uh, derives from. So that, that's, that's the broad proposal, that's what we're trying to capture, the examples of mediation that are not about criminalization, that are not about saying, okay, we're going to give these bad kids a new chance, but are about trying to instill some, sort, some form of care within the community in order to address uh, some of the, the violence. So, on the final part of, of the presentation, I'll, I'll briefly discuss the main objectives and the methodology. So, the overall aim of the mediation work is to produce a white paper of recommendations for mediation practitioners and policy makers. I think the idea here, as far as I, and this is obviously still for discussion, this is just a proposal so we can, we can amend it as we see fit, but the idea here, rather than just to come up with examples of good practice, uh, delivered by a government somewhere in the world is to say how can we actually think about about community mediation about on the ground empirical mediation how can we frame this in a way that might be beneficial to to to, pe to policymakers that are receptive to other ways of thinking about and managing gang conflict um, so the 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 main objective will be um, will be delivered via via three sub objectives the first is to conduct a scoping exercise of policy responses to the problem of gang conflict mediation in the 12 uh, trans-gang field sites and internationally. So what I mean by a, a structured template is really a, a, um, a framework for, for, for comparing these different policies um, and, and for, um, so yeah, so a structured template for the comparative analysis of prevention policies and mediation interventions, policy documents, published grey literature, etc in the 12 trans-gang field sites will be developed. The template will comprise a number of conceptual categories which will be developed from anthropological and other social science literatures concerning policy and governance and other relevant areas. The categories will provide the means of understanding how the different contextual factors, national and local experiences, and approaches to gang mediation result in different outcomes for those in, in the processes and their communities. Sorry, that's really bad English. Um, the second objective, sub-objective, um, is to conduct primary data is to conduct primary data collection around examples of on-the-ground mediation from across the trans-gang data set. So basically, my idea here is, in order to capture these on-the-ground examples of mediation, I think the first part of call would be to speak to the local researchers, the, the, the twelve local researchers, to maybe even as a, as a formal interview to try and understand. Um, to try and capture or bring together the different examples of mediation that are happening across the data set, or maybe to, uh, to develop some kind of, um, I don't know, some, some kind of framework or something in order for them. So first of all, I'm gonna approach this by, by looking at the data that we already have. If there are particular examples of mediation uh, experiences which are, which are relevant to the project, then I might do some additional field work myself around that, particularly if they are in Barcelona or Madrid, for example. Um, third, is to develop a critical perspective on mediation, and this is really what I've been, I've been trying to do uh, during this presentation. So the third aim is to develop a, a, a critical perspective on gang conflict mediation by situation policies and practices in a broader political and socioeconomic context. This will be conducted to support the development of the white paper and other published outcomes detailed below, and will build on the theoretical positions outlined above. So that's it, basically. So that, that's my, uh, that, that's, that, that's how I see the mediation experiences side of the project um, forming, and uh, I'd appreciate any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Adam, for, for your presentation, for these uh, very interesting um, reflections and the introduction of the, of the ethics of care in, in this area of mediation and mediation 
experiences. So now I will give the word to Jorge Rodriguez, who will comment on, on, on these reflections. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to be here and, and be the discussant of this uh, very interesting paper. Um, I'm afraid I'm not really an expert in uh, mediation, uh, nor in gang uh, research, uh, uh, neither I am a, a, an ethnographer. So in a sense, I'm going to try to, I'm a sociologist, I, I work in criminology, so I think I do have a perspective, and, and I'm going to try to be a little bit critical, in a sense, uh, uh, but also as much as possible constructive. Uh, from a point of view which is, in a sense, a, a little bit detached from what you do. Um, so in any case, I found the paper very interesting, very suggestive, um, and in that sense, uh, I liked it. It's very, it, it, it can be read very easily, and, and it, it brings a lot of, of, of interesting issues uh, that I think uh, are worth uh, discussing. Um, let me, let me explain what I think I read in the paper, so I might be wrong uh, in my interpretation. Uh, I had the feeling that the paper was a, a critique of uh, current mediation pol uh, practices, uh, but I'm not sure if that is really uh, what the paper is about. I mean, it's a paper. I'm going to talk about, about a paper when, in fact, it's more a project than a paper, but at, you know, uh, at least the format is. So that was my, my feeling, was that it was uh, um, some kind of criticism of uh, current practices uh, in terms of mediation. So why? Why does Adam think that you know, uh, these practices are unfair uh, and, and are, are wrong or are not good enough? Uh, partly because they are unfair. That's what I read or the way I read it. Um, I'm not sure really. Uh, how to define unfair uh, in his own words. It seemed to me that what he had in mind is that uh, mediation serves sometimes the interest of those who shouldn't be served, or the, the interest that should not be served, and, and that in the end does not really serve the interest of, of those who are involved in the mediation, are, and perhaps the immediate uh, uh, the community, you know, that is uh, that has to deal with the, the gang violence. So that 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 was my f my my first impression is that there was this kind of criticism of uh, of the unfairness of mediation because of the objectives, and this is the other problem: the objective that it pursues. Uh, so it seemed that, from what I read in the paper, mediation sometimes uh, uh, tries to not to really mediate or to uh, do conflict resolution, which is really what mediation should be about, but that it tries to uh, dissolve uh, gangs or deal with the problem of, of gangs uh, per se, rather than, than with violence, uh, uh, gangs' violence. I mean, part of the problem that I had when, when I read that is that, okay, but gangas are, are there anyway, you know, uh, and it seems to me that they are problematic in the, in the, in the eyes, not just, you know, of, uh, of mediators, but of, of many other people in the community and in the society at large. There is clearly a correlation between gangs and gang violence, and, uh, and we cannot really um, think that it's not there. So. We, we might need to do something uh, about it. So, uh, what I mean is that conflict resolution may be a way uh, right, of, of, uh, of solving necessarily a social problem that is out there. So this is part of, uh, of, of, of one issue that I have. The other is that it appears to be inefficient. So one is that it would be unfair because it serves the purposes of the society at large, of those who are powerful and, and in a sense, not close enough to the problem. And the other is that it, it might be even inefficient uh, and not solve the main problems that is, it, it, it tries to, to solve. And, and again, this because it, it, it pursues the wrong objective, which is to eliminate gangs rather than truly conflict a resolution. Okay, 
I think that one suggestion that I have is that perhaps it's not so interesting to know uh, whether uh, mediation is effective or not, um, uh, or that to do that we might need to first to define the criteria by which we will judge, you know, mediation to be successful. Uh, and if we could do that, then it might be also might very interesting to determine the conditions under which, you know, uh, mediation might be efficient or inefficient. Uh, and also, or the, way, or the conditions and the circumstances in which we can align the general interest with the particular interest as well. It's so something that, you know, the, the interest of the community and the society at large with the interest of the gangs themselves. Uh, so in, that might be more, I think, uh, useful than just to try to make up this idea or, or to these broad criticisms that mediation doesn't work or that it works. Uh, so something somewhat in between, under which, condition, under which circumstances we could make it more ethical or more aligned with the interests or, or more of more groups and then solve more problems, including the social problem that appears to be the problem of gangs out there. Um, then the paper moves into suggesting that we should take a new perspective on mediation, which is the perspective of uh, the ethics of care rather than the ethics of choice. If I understood correctly, the ethics of choice are those that seek to uh, solve a problem by maximizing, in a sense, the interest of the people involved in, the, in that conflict, or coming out with the right decisions that maximize uh, satisfaction and interest of, 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 of the gangs that are involved in that mediation. That's, that's what I understood it's a choice, a, the, the ethics of choice. And, and Adam kind of, you know, uh, crit criticizes this and, and proposes a new ethics based on the ethics of care, which should be less about looking for uh, or to, to work things in a way so that the authors come out with the right decision, which would be, in a sense, that of, of not being violent anymore against each other, uh, and understand that this is a, a, a long-term problem that needs not just one quick fix, that's your, your words, uh, you cannot, there, is a, there isn't a cure, uh, but you need to care about this in, in, in the long term. And because this is a problem which is structural, mm -hmm. right? Which is related uh, to, uh, but I'll talk about, about that in a, in, in, in a moment. One problem that I found with this is that it seems to me that it's a little bit too vague. I mean, too vague is the ethics of care. All right, I understand that it, it depends on, it's, it's, we are told that uh, they should be context related and contingent, what the mediator should do should be contingent to uh, the situation in which the person, the, the mediator is involved and, and the circumstances in which uh, the gangs are, 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 are involved as well. Uh, but we don't know which conditions are those. So it, it remains very vague in my view uh, and very subjective. Then the other, the other thing is that it's not only contingent in terms of, uh, of uh, the circumstances, the, the context, the geographical, uh, but also in, in terms of time. This needs a long time to be fixed. But once again, how long? <laughs> uh, what is long and what is short? So it seems to me that it's too vague. It's, it's an idea that this has to be there forever or not, because it's a problem that cannot really be solved. I mean, is this tension between really interventions that that are directed, the usual ones, towards solving a problem quickly, but then contraposed by, by an, a, a, a completely opposite uh, uh, kind of ethics or approach that is, okay, uh, we, cannot, we cannot solve this problem, we just have to do that, this at all times or forever and, and change it all the time. But then I find it very vague in terms of the objectives, the, the criteria, the outcomes that, that, that have to come out of that uh, intervention, uh, even the time frame for, 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 
for achieving this. So it seems to me that it needs some kind of, of a concrete, more concrete uh, um, workout. You know, I can understand that care is something that has to be done all the time, but I think it needs more, more, more concretion. Um, then we get into the application of the of the of the of this kind of um, care ethics, and what we are told told is that they need to be applied in a way so as to, to understand that the problem, in a sense, th the reason why these ethics have to be applied is that the problem is a long-term problem, is structural, and you cannot, do solve, you cannot solve really these problems by, by the mediation per se. So that this is a, there are these inequalities, capitalism. Um, first of all, I, I, not that I'm a, a pro-capitalist <laughs> at all, but it seems to me that it's, it's irrelevant for the paper, the mention of capitalism or inequalities. I mean, you could perfectly deal with this with the issues of, of, of marginal, you know, uh, poverty, marginalization, uh, um, really, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure particularly in, in a study that, that with so many countries, with so many kind of different forms of, if you want to talk, to, to define them as capitalist, but well, different, different interpretations of capitalism and even probably some societies that are not capitalist at all, like Cuba, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so in the end, I, I wonder whether this well, mentioned- but, but still connected to the capital political economy globally, so. Okay, <laughs> but, but is that helpful in the end? That's what I'm trying to say. Is that helpful, this reference to a very broad, large uh, structures? Because if we do, then in the end, there is this tension between what, what can work out of, my, because mediation is something that is very practical. I mean, you brought a very good issue, because that's what really, really been bothering me, <laughs> right? Between the issue of what is, what are the practical uh, aspects of mediation, which are very clear, which is to solve a conflict, and then these more kind of second objectives of mediation that should be more related to the kind of uh, society where gangs uh, operate and, and for, you know, and the reasons why, why vi gang violence uh, exists. And these are the ones that I find is more difficult for me to, to find a role for mediation mm -hmm. uh, in, in, this, in this sense. But I understand that, you know, on the other hand, mediation should be, in a sense, already kind of aligned into, or at least be aware that these problems exist so that they, they, they can, in a sense, uh, fix them. Um, and there is a, also a kind of a contradiction because in a, it, you start criticizing uh, mediation, the use of mediation because it's unethical, because it serves the purposes of the large, of the public at large, right? As against the interest of the, of the, of the actors involved in the conflict, to uh, conclude that actually mediation should do something about solving the, or doing something for the community where the, where the gangs are, are embedded. Fine. But then you have to distinguish between the public, this kind of public at large, that is a very, an, a very abstract notion, and community as something much more local. And that's not very well developed in the, in the paper. So I think it should be there, this distinction between the, the local community, the one that really suffers the consequences of gang violence as against the interest of the society at large that may know nothing about the, what is going on in that neighborhood or in that place. And, and I think this distinction between sh would be more, much more useful. And then, because otherwise it, it seems like a contradiction mm -hmm. to criticize the use of mediation as an instrument uh, to bring the, you know, the interests of the public, but then support doing the same thing uh, for the interests of the community. It's a different abstract concept. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But I think it can be worked out. Yeah, it yeah. can be worked out. Um, all right, uh, finally, with respect to the objectives and methodology, um, you propose to do three things. One is to do a scoping exercise of policy responses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
which I think it would be kind of a, I, I, again, is a little bit vague, this part, so I, I wasn't sure whether you wanted to do something kind of a, of a meta-analysis, you know, of, uh, of, but then if it's a meta-analysis, would this take into account the effectiveness of those interventions? Uh, because you you will have to deal with the issue of the effectiveness of the interventions okay. in one way or another, um, and that takes me to another issue because you say you, you have to you want to look at how contextual factors influence outcomes. You say, mm -hmm. well, define outcome. That's my problem. Mm -hmm. Then then it's a very concrete outcome. Conflict resolution is the outcome of bringing or aligning the interests of the community and the gangs or the society at large. It needs to be redefined in terms of the outcomes. And that brings me to your second objective, which is really on the, to create an underground inventory of mediation experiences. I think you should start with this. Mm -hmm. You should start with this to see really what works or how it works. Because what works, I don't know. You will have to deal again with the issue of efficiency and effectiveness, and I'm not sure that you, you will be able to, to do that with the instruments that you have. But at least to know, to have this kind of repertoire of, uh, of, uh, of uh, mediation practices that certainly will be very different in, in many different contexts, and, and perhaps see precisely how uh, mediators have applied different solutions to uh, to similar problems under different circumstances. And that might help you then uh, create the criteria, at least or propose the criteria by which you could organize this kind of more broader uh, uh, list uh, of, uh, of uh, policy responses uh, towards gang uh, uh, violence. And, um, and then the critical perspective should be the last thing, <laughs> <laughs> not the first, or that's how I see it. Because then you would learn really from from the ground yeah, yeah, yeah. down down you know uh, from down up uh, really what works and, and what criteria and what the problems and what e even if ethical issues and moral issues involved in there. But anyway, it's, again, I, I I'm acting here at the devil's advocate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, th thank you very much. Um, I, I should admit that I'm not an expert on gang conflict mediation either. Um, but thank you. I think it, um, you, you, it, it was very thoughtful comments, and I think that they they uh, articulated some of my misgivings about about the proposal as it as it's currently constituted. I think to kind of work backwards slightly on on the comments you made, the the scope and exercise. Yeah, I mean. It, you know, theoretically, it could be enormous. And how would we measure success? You know, what kind of metrics will we use? And I really don't think that, that we have, or well, trans gang has a kind of interest within trying to measure the success of gang policies. We're more interested in trying to contribute a, a new critical perspective to the existing discourse on, 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 uh, on gang intervention strategies. We're not statisticians. We probably don't have the... the you know, we, we don't we don't have the expertise to do that kind of analysis. Um, yeah, and so I think you're right that the, the, the scope and exercise will have to focus on categories that emerge from on the ground activities. And I think this is exactly the idea that we have, although it's difficult to try and organise. Uh, and I think you're right that actually to, to to change the order around might be quite good. But I, I want to pick up on the earlier comments. A, a little bit, um, push back a little bit on that. I think, I don't think that what I'm interested in is, is whether gang mediation strategies are successful or whether they work on their own terms, whether they reduce gang activity, whether they reduce gang violence. This is a, an important question, but it's not necessarily the question that, that I'm interested in. What, what I'm interested in and why I've, I, I've, I've, I've um, why I've brought this, this literature on care into it, is to try and rethink the problem of, of, of gang violence and, and gang conflict mediation. 
and to try and think of and to try and think about not only formal processes of mediation, the kinds of things that we've been discussing so far, but also the kind of everyday work that people do to mediate their 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 intergang, intercommunity, interfamilial conflicts. The, that probably will not get called conflict mediation. That will probably not be categorised as such. And this is, you know. Um, for example, in, 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 in Jose's work, so he's looking at these, these kinds of ongoing, within North, the North African context, these kinds of ongoing day-to-day -day process of, 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 mediating, of mediating conflict within the community. And I think that this is the reason that I've, I've, that, that I've brought in the Kerlitz tree is to try to broaden what we mean when we say mediation. So it's not just about an external agency or even an internal agency going in and trying to address a very particular and well-defined um, problem. Um, and I think that, the, yeah, the, the interest here is not necessarily to make better gang prevention policy either. This is not really what, what we're trying to do is, is to work out what an ethnographic contribution to this discussion would look like. And what ethnography is very good at is capturing these on the ground experiences. If we went in and said, okay, we're going to look at mediation, okay, that's an example of mediation, but what our, our definitions of what, medi what is mediation will come from, from the emic, from, from the ground up, from the ethnographic details, and that will help us to redefine what we mean, or this is the hope that we will re be able to redefine what we mean by mediation, and that will be, from there we can make some kind of contribution to these broader, more established discussions um, within political science and so on. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so the question of mediation, I, um, it's not really, a, I, I wasn't trying to critique mediation as a practice necessarily. I'm not trying to say, you, you said at one point that, that I see it as unethical or, or and that wasn't, you didn't just say unethical, um, I can't remember the word you use now, but unfair. I see it, unfair, exactly, I see it as unfair. It's not necessarily that I see it as unfair, what I see it as, the, the discourse in itself, is that it tends to exclude a whole load of, of, of necessary social activity, the kind of everyday mediation. So, so my critique of the discourse on mediation isn't to say that it's a bad discourse, that it's you know, a pillar of neoliberalism or something like that. It's more to say that it, by defin it, its definitions, its categories, exclude a whole load of activity that goes on day to day to mediate relationships within a community, within a gang space, within so on and so on. So it's really about what that discourse ignores rather than the failures of that discourse in its own terms. If you, if you, that, that was really what I'm getting at. I think that probably I could do a lot more work within the proposal to actually point out from the very beginning that this is why I'm making this critique. I think you're completely right uh, for saying that the, the, the critique kind of just goes on. It doesn't really tell you, well, why do we need this critique, right? Well, we need this critique because I think that the discourse itself has inherent, inherent limits and they can be pushed. We know because of our existing uh, empirical materials that there is a whole load of stuff that this discourse excludes, a whole load of work that happens on the ground day to day that this discourse excludes because it sees, first of all, gang violence as a discrete problem. So you mentioned that gang violence is a, is, is a problem. Well, okay, violence is a problem. Why we call it gang violence or not, for me, is an entirely different thing. So if I can give you one short example from the UK. In, in Manchester, in the, in, we have a problem with gang violence in an area called Moss Side. Moss Side is an area that, that has a large Afro-Caribbean community and a large Somali community. It doesn't have higher rates of crime than the white community that is in North Manchester, the white working class communities in North Manchester, but it has gang problems. Why is it that it gets called gang problems there? Well, basically because they're black. They, 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 they tend to, the, the, within the discourse on gang violence in the UK, it tends to be seen as a problem within the black community. And why is this important? Because by, call, by the police calling it gang violence, they're able to channel resources from the national gang prevention strategy into Moss Side. What happens when they channel resources into Moss Side is they bring more police into Moss Side. When they bring more police into Moss Side, there's more eyes seeing people smoking cannabis, seeing people doing graffiti, and everyone suddenly gets criminalized, and that then leads to this idea that they have a gang problem. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then if you go to Moston in the north of Manchester, which is a white community, well, all the kids are doing exactly the same thing. There is just the, the same rate of murders, just the same rate of crime, but they don't get, they don't get criminalized because there's less police because they don't have a gang problem. So part of the, 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 
the focus here is to problematize this idea that, that gang violence is the problem. Well, violence is the problem. <laughs> you know, it's like if you suddenly get rid of gangs, you're still going to have an absolute cast iron a statistical correlation between poverty and violence. It just takes a different form, right? So that, that's really the reasons why I'm trying to problematize some of these concepts. But I, I, I admit that I think we, the, the, the proposal is, is in its infancy, effectively. And I think that we do need to think about exactly how it relates to these other debates. At the moment, it is just the kind of genesis and idea. But thank you. It was a, a really helpful uh, comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, Jose, I think you also would like to comment something. Jorge mentioned before. No, so. it's only about uh, the, uh, a comment that it's uh, sent us by email for uh, coming from Morocco, from the Rashid Tuhtu researcher, no? that he thinks it's very interesting according with our transnational perspective. Um, Rashid comment that in the case of Muslim majority countries where Islam is the culture of everyday life of the people and where laws are inspired from religion, experiences in mediation processes, example of radical terrorist Islamists in Morocco in 23, in 23 27 and 2011, they use religious leaders or they use alternative religions provide very efficient in the, the radicalization processes. In the case of Judistry groups, said Rashid, the mosque and the imam and popular religion is used in such conflicts, either in the street conflict or in getting members to repent from their street activities. And, said, and he said, in my interviews conducted so far in the sites in Morocco, religion, Islam is the case, is a refugee identity to youth street groups members to end their activities and repent and become a model respected by family members and street neighbors and society in general. Islamist groups also can use it to recruit street youth people to join radical Islamist groups. The police use some members as spies on other groups. I think that the religious perspective can be added to other dimensions, say, in looking at mediation processes. Uh, this is the comment, but also, also with I, 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 I was uh, a meeting with uh, Rashid and the other, and Kamel and Sihem and other members of the North African teams. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they explained that they're finding this. And also, when I talk with Juan Camilo in, in, in Mansilla in Marsella, they also, he is fine the same way. Religion is important to avoid the people and, and, to, um, and to help the people to leave the street and this kind of uh, everyday life uh, activities. So my, my question is, could be the same in these diasporic situations of Arab, Arab, uh, Arab, uh, Arab uh, people in Barcelona, Marseille, and Milano? I think that this topic could be an interesting comparative perspective according with the idea of, of transnationalism used in the project. So uh, when we talk about religion, we cannot, uh, we cannot have in mind the same meaning of religion that we have here. This is religion in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Arabic, Ar Arabic uh, population is not a private issue. It's a public issue, issue. And, 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 the, and the, the respect about the, the religious uh, ways of uh, mediation, it's very important for this population. So the idea is not only to, to use uh, religion in our, in our, uh, in our understanding of, of, of this social uh, phenomena. So, I, I, this is only a, a question that we can discuss if maybe we can introduce this comparative and contrast uh, perspective of religion in, the, in this different, in this different, uh, in this different uh, location. Also, uh, Rashid said, the state apparat apparatuses, including government, non-government organizations, are dominating mediation processes in Morocco. 
with the street youth groups and mainly with the lines who were imprisoned. There is a big national project laid by the king as head of the state and the king as commander of the faithful, very important in the, in the, in, in, in the Moroccan society, providing training, education, income generation activities to get gang members out of from criminal activities and integrate them in society. I think that this, uh, this comment also is related with, politic, pol with the politics in the streets, you know, and how this, all these questions are managed uh, with the mediation processes. Um, um, and related with this question, the idea that I, uh, that I want to ask to, especially to Adam, is, okay, we try to say something about uh, uh, positive, Bene be uh, benefits from these mediation processes, but to evaluate, to evaluate these processes and say it also in the, in the paper, correctly develop it. But for who? This is the question, no? Okay, what mean exactly if they have benefits for who? For the society, for the group, for the individual? I think that we can try to to compose a, a, a methodology to, to try to understand because we are not social workers, we are not mediators, to understand exactly all, all this all this situation in this tri, in this camp of, uh, of of mediation. And also, this is only a comment that I I I, I, I support my comment with the comment of the Rashid, because we agree and we discuss a lot of about this. And we have an Consist and precise question that coming from Roger Soulet. He said, it has, it has appeared several times in the presentation that there is a dimension of mediation related to work not only on the group, gang, but also on the community perception of social danger. To what extent this dimension of mediation is consolidated in the literature? Do you know if there is any practical experience on mediation working with community perception, perception of social danger? It's a very clear question. So if you want to, sure. to answer something. Okay. Um, I, I, I think the question of, of, uh, of kind of non, I think non-Western settings is probably, is probably not the right concept, but you'll understand why I use that uh, as I explain. My, my, uh, all my previous research is in the UK, and, and my, my current research is here, so I do have a very kind of Western-centric, conceptual way of seeing the world via ideas like care and capitalism, neoliberalism, and so on, and I think that, that we, there will be a lot of anthropological uh, comparative work in order to think about what is the significance of, 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 of mediation within, within uh, North Africa, for example. And, I, and clearly, you know, uh, when when we start to talk about about mediation, there we're talking about a, a different, probably a different set of agencies and a very different kind of social fabric with a very different history, with very different relationships to to uh, formalised welfare and so on and so on. So, yeah, I think that that's, that for me is, is 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 one of the main questions that we need to now develop within the proposal, or not necessarily the proposal, but within the work, is exactly what this will look like cross-culturally. I think that one of the weaknesses of the paper is that we haven't, I haven't really developed that side of it so much. Um, in terms of the displacement and social danger, yeah, I, I, uh, that, that, that term I, I borrowed directly from, from their work. And it stood out for me, I think, for the same reason, that, that it's, again, it, it, it ties into this idea of going beyond how we might think of mediation as addressing a discrete problem. So if you, you know, gang violence is a problem, the mediation, the solution is no more gang violence, where actually when they start talking about the, you know, reconstituting social bonds, displacement of ideas of danger and so on, we're talking about something much broader than mediation. But these are mediation practitioners that are, that are citing these effects as, as a consequence of mediation. That's why I've, I've, I've kind of emphasized it in the paper, because it's one of these examples where you think, wait a minute, this is well. This is such a, bit, a much bigger phenomenon than 
uh, than, than, than the mediation literature actually indicates sometimes. So, no, I don't know of any on the ground <laughs> examples of this, but if, if Roger does, then please tell me. <laughs> I think that's what I'm interested in capturing, precisely that. Um, I think that's, that's, that's it for me. Okay, thank you so much. We have another question from uh, Transgang researcher Maria Oliver. So this is a question for Adam and Jose. So she asks, what, what about the challenge it has supposed for you to develop the project's ethical and mediation protocols, taking into account the cultural and legal differences of the countries which participate in the research? So how has it been for you, uh, how has it been addressed, and if it has implied like limitations, no, mm -hmm. in that respect? Um, I mean, I need to separate, make a, make a distinction between the mediation work and my other responsibility, which is to develop ethical protocols. <laughs> I see the two things as entirely separate. They are the ethics. When I discuss ethics in this presentation, and when, uh, when I discuss research ethics, I'm talking about two quite distinct phenomena. Um, they are related, but probably to explain how they are related would take up more time uh, than we have. When I talk about ethics within this, within this um, presentation, I'm not talking about a, a set of, a codified set of rules like what you would have with research ethics. So research ethics is really simple. You have like four principles, you apply it to the real world. Autonomy is one, you know, or, well, uh, um, you know, the right to choose whether you participate in the research. So you just apply them principles, right? Ethics, ethnographic ethics, as in ethics when we're studying ethics on the ground, is a much more complex phenomenon. This is about how people work out ideas of good and bad within their everyday human interactions. It's a complex process. How that relates to social norms and social rules is a, and politics and so on is, a, is also a huge discussion. Um, but can you just repeat some of the question? I, I lost the end. Sorry, I have to go back one minute. So... Mm -hmm. no, no, yes. Just the same question. I just need to hear it again. Okay. She, so Maria asked what it has supposed for you to develop the project's ethical and mediation protocol, protocols, taking into account the cultural and maybe legal differences of the countries yeah. which participate in the so research. So I, I think in terms of mediation, in, in, if I speak about the two things separately, you know, in terms of research ethics, it's a kind of separate conversation. But you know, so I'll leave that aside. In terms of the the proposal that we have at the moment, the, the mediation work. That, that is the challenge, I think, is to try and understand, you know, and that is why, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm trying to problematize the kind of global or international discourse on mediation is in order for it to be able to more adequately capture the role of, of, of um, Islamic organizations, for example, within mediation practices. The, this focus, because a lot of the, the gang mediation policies emerge, kind of emerge within the United States and then circulate around policy circles, which tend to have a kind of ethnocentric, Western-centric focus on them, they, they, they do kind of structurally tend to exclude practices that don't appear like what they mean when they say mediation. And so I think that that, that is the, the challenge of the project. And one of the things that we're working on is to try to come up with a much broader definition of mediation without it becoming, you know, like when you ever, whenever you broaden a definition, completely meaningless. So to try and what, what are we talking about when we mean mediation? How can that be applied cross-culturally? That, that I think that's one of the, what we'd hope would be the outcomes of the project. Perfect, thank you so much. And Maria also wanted in that respect, maybe related with what you commented, Adam, a response to Jorge Rodriguez um, to clarify, because she is also a researcher of the projects that we analyze the results of our pro proposal, but that the core cases of the Transgang uh, project are chosen because supposedly those proposals and those types of mediation policies with the groups are already underway. Mm -hmm. So we analyze what results these policies have in places in which, in which they have been applied for a while, such as the example of Comuna Trece and Medellin, for example. So, um, yeah, Jose? Only following the question of uh, Maria about the ethical pr protocols that we are implementing in the, in the project and we are constructing, uh, our idea, I think that uh, Adam agreed with me in this question, 
is a very general understanding of the ethical to implement in the project. And we think that we uh, give all the, all the freedom for the researchers of the to know exactly if this question is uh, ethical or not. This means that they are, we are implementing, and uh, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, Adam, Adam said in the, in, the, in, the, in the background paper, this idea of empirical ethics. This is the idea because nobody knows better than a, a local researcher what happened in, in some place and you know, how can manage this situation. And this is especially important for the, for the, for, uh, for the case of risk in the, in the field work. Okay, in our perception, maybe one, uh, one situation is very, very violent for us. But in the local context, they are, this is the manners, this is the, the, everyday, uh, the everyday conduct. And maybe it's not really, really uh, sound, sound uh, than violent for, than for us. And for this reason, our principle to construct our protocols is to give freedom to the local researchers to understand the situation and to evaluate it. Because if not, we lost all the, uh, all the, uh, all the particularities in, in each location. This is very important. We are only have a framework of ethical and, uh, procedures, only to, to remark this. I want to know nothing. Thank you, Jose. And we have another very interesting question from Margot Mecca, which she's also a Transgang researcher uh, of the visual anthropology part of the project. So this is a question, I think, for Adam and also maybe for Jose. What implications in terms of gender, for example, gender relations, gender identities, do you foresee regarding gang mediation? I ask this because of the link you made between care and mediation and also the the role of gender that comes into play, maybe if we talk about about care. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's clearly. I think the, it's another limitation of the, of the proposal. That gender, it, she, she's correct. That gender is focuses. That, that gender is appears throughout the paper actually. I talk about sex, you know, the comparison between, uh, between gang violence and sexual violence. You know, why is it that the gang violence is seen as such a, such a social problem that must be addressed by, these, by all this intervention, where it's kind of, you know, routinized domestic violence, sexual violence, and so on, doesn't, get, doesn't, doesn't receive the same, the same set of interventions. So, well, this because gang violence is public, right? And sexual and domestic violence tends to happen in the private sphere. So it's not a socially apparent. Um, how, how this, how I imagine the relationship between, between gender um, and, 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 and gang mediation, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I haven't, ex I haven't explored it. I think the, the main way that I imagine, that, that I would like to problematize that relationship is to talk about um, who gets considered victims of gang violence. So often when you, within the, the kind of, the, the more kind of um, simplistic, sim simplistic representations of the situation, you have this kind of coherent group of victims of gang violence and this coherent group of gangsters. Well, of course, gangsters are also victims of gang violence, probably the principal victims of gang violence, uh, yeah, I, presumably especially if, uh, if you know, I, I don't know, I don't know enough about this, but the role of uh, female gangsters and so on and so on. Would are likely to be the recipients of, of, of violence and sexual violence and so on. And so I think that we, we come back to this question of gender when we start to problematize this question of victimhood and, and, and this kind of set of concepts where you have the state which represents the victims of the violence and then you have the victims who themselves are, tend to be voiceless because the state appropriates their pain in order to do some forms of political action and then you have the gangsters. So probably within this triad of actors to try and problematize this triad of actors is where we get to some kind of question, how, how we would approach the questions of gender, but I mean, I'm really kind of thinking off the top of my head because I haven't, I haven't given enough thought to gender within this, uh, within the proposal. Thank you so much for the answer. Of course, I think this is an, 
ongoing project uh, and ongoing process thinking about the gender, then Absolutely. gender issue and gender relations in the Transcan research. Um, I don't know if we have any questions. Um, Jose, did you see some more questions in the... Yeah. Another comment of, the, of Rashid about the mediation processes in Morocco, informal mediation processes. Said in Morocco, and care and gender also, mm -hmm. there is a heavy culture of mothers protecting their sons or daughters and daughters from the street violence. The image of the goddess mother caring and protecting sons and daughters from violence is in the, in the, in, in the cultural imaginaries. And this is very important also with the, with the idea no? of gender, care, and what happened in the street for mediation processes to save to the sons and daughters from, the, from this violence. Only this comment. Ah, say you another thing, <laughs> uh, Rashid said. There are also indirect victims indicted victims, the, the women, wives, sisters, and mothers of street violence. So gender as a cultural construct is, mobi is mobilized in processes of mediation, either formal or informal. Mm -hmm. So I think that the Rashid wants to mean that always gender is inside of this, think, of, this situ of this situation of violence and mediation and processes. I think this is, I mean, this is, we, 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 I think probably we're now speaking well beyond the, the mediation experiences project, because I think that the mediation experiences project is, is a, a small sub-project of trans gang. The, the gender and gangs, the differences between the role of gender within North Africa and, and Latin America, female gangsters and gang members in Latin America tend not to be. These are huge questions that are not that, that are huge trans gang questions, right? They're not necessarily uh, mediation questions. <laughs> and clearly they're extremely interesting as well. I'm not trying to, 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 to shut down the discussion, but I think that, you know, a lot of the, the, the mediation uh, project is really about a very specific set of social phenomena, um, whereas the, trans, you know, the, the, the role of gender is such a, such a, a larger question in itself that we, we're probably going to address that via its own set of, uh, set of work, right? Now I, I, I am remembered some kind of, some, I, especially one paper from, I don't remember the, the notograph, but I can, I can look in for, that there she was talking about the role of the mothers, especially the mothers, during the Arab Spring situation. And in this paper, the ethnography is focused on what happened in the, in, 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 in the, in the, in the homes of these people now. And, 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 and the conclusion is that if the mothers are not cooking or preparing a cake to celebrate uh, uh, an, an anniversary, it's impossible that the men go to the streets to to make the revolution. But this is very important because the same you can find in El, Salva, in El Salvador guerrilla. The, signif the, import, the significant import, uh, role of the mothers of, uh, of the, of the, of the mil milicianos to, to, to maintain the life, you know? If you don't have a woman maintaining the life in the home, you cannot do it anything. Thank you so much, uh, Jose, for the comment. I think it's, uh, as Adam pointed out, uh, exactly these kind of examples in the, in the field work and, and examples that we will further collect that will guide us in this, in this construction. No? What is really, what are mediation experiences and processes? And um, yeah, so we have- We a, have a, we have a question of Eduardo Ballester that is here, but maybe he cannot talk directly. And I try to, to to formulate the question, yeah? Thanks for the presentation and the discussion. I found this idea of mediation and came very interesting as a long-term project. A project that involves the entire community in some way. But what about young people who had migrated alone? How can that be done without those community ties or without family or without family or, 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 friend, or friend networks? Also taking into account that many times there are young people who move through different cities and countries. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, this is this is my interest as well. You know, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to talk now uh, about something broader than just <laughs> mediation. Um, but I think I think probably the relationship the relationship between care, what I call care, which is the ability to to feed your, you know provide food and education and social support for each other mutually and for yourself and so on. And these ten this tends to be the, the sphere of social activity which, which is most eroded um, within the context of kind of neoliberal structural adjustment and so on. Um, and I think when we're talking about, particularly in, in Barcelona, um, with recent immigrants in Barcelona, I think probably a way to understand their experiences is a, as a crisis of care. You know, they, they emerge into a, a, a city that has a relatively small uh, North African population compared to somewhere like Marseille, right? Um, that has very relatively little social support for them, available social support, jobs, so on and so on. So they are, you know, experiencing what I would call a crisis of care or marginality or, or, and so on, you know. Um, how, you know, what kind of intervention <laughs> would resolve this? I don't know. I don't know. But probably, like 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 you say, I do this this kind of ongoing. You know, the the, the thing I'm trying to highlight here is that you, that what the, the the what the communities we're talking about seem to need is not intervention, but 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 a, a, a kind of new relationship with the state. So this idea of intervention, quick fix, well, no, what they need is a, a very different relationship with the estate and the national economy. So that would be my, uh, my idea, but I'm not entirely sure. About the, the, the question of community ties or something like this in the, can, in the case of uh, uh, minors that, uh, that come in uh, alone here to Barcelona, I, I asked this question in, 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 in two interviews and also in my, in my observation and some informal, informal conversations in the mosque here in El Clot. You can find that, that, that uh, it's very important that these people uh, outside of the houses of, uh, uh, that were living according with the rules of the, of the Catalonian uh, social work, uh, the idea is that, uh, and I try to also to to find an as mother association in the club the mosque that they are trying to to help these people, these young people. But the idea is that they must to be a good Muslim. This is very important. Because if not, if they don't mo them prove that they are a good Muslim, they are not. They are also marginalized for their own people. So they are alone, alone. So you can find also in the case of some fights in the Maresme uh, village that I, I, I remember so well in TV that uh, that one uh, Muslim uh, girl was interviewed by the, by, the, by the TV and said, they are not good Muslims. Because of this, I throw stones to him. But they are coming from Maghrebian countries. This is very important. Other time, religion is in the very center of this question. So they are alone, sure that they are alone. They must to prove that they are good Muslims to get help of this, uh, uh, say, the, let me say, Muslim associations. Like the uh, Claude Mose here, that this is a mother association to try to help these people, and also these people was who is it? Repartir? No, repartir. <laughs> yeah, and it's here um, uh, giving food during the pandemic to these people in, in some houses, and also to poor families that go to the most to demand this, uh, this help. Because in Muslim uh, ideas, zakat means that you must demand if you are poor. 
is not only to give if you are rich to the poor people. The poor people must to ask this help. It's very important because if not, they not want to help any, anybody. Just to, I think I think there's an interesting parallel with some of the some of the, the more kind of um, some of the policy the policy on, on gang mediation. I think that, that having this conversation has actually enabled me to, to, to think about the proposal in, in slightly different terms. I think probably what I object to uh, is the idea that gang conflict emerges because of some kind of moral failure on behalf of gangsters. Um, and I think that my 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 basis for understanding it would be, no, it's a collective economic, socioeconomic failure that leads to gang conflict. Um, how we then think about the solution, because the solution does also seem to be framed in moral terms often, that you have this idea of delinquency, that you have these kids that are just doing bad things and need to be shown the right way, this kind of hyper-Americanized idea. Uh, and, and I think it echoes what you're saying then, that you know, there's, there's somehow there's a moral failure on behalf of the kids in the street that, that, that because they're not good Muslims. It's interesting the parallel between how these institutions approach the problem. And, and, and I guess my question would be, well, why, why, do they, why, why is it that they want to speak in moral language about this in terms of, you know, in terms of individual decision making or in terms of good Muslim, bad Muslim, good kid, bad kid? You know, what, what, what attracts them to this language rather than, well, it's, to me, it, seems, it always seems about responsibility. And if you can say that gang violence emerges because of the moral failures of a particular individual, well, I can absorb my responsibility for this. If you say, well, actually, gang violence emerges because of the impoverishment of that individual, well, then I have to think, well, maybe that's because I've got more money than him. You know? So I think there is a, it becomes a quite... Thinking about economically broadens the kind of nexus or the network of responsibilities and obligations that, that we think about. I mean, that's, that, that's why I come to this kind of analysis or trying to push this kind of analysis, which highlights, like you said, the structural determinants of, of gang violence. Um, yeah, so just, just to pick up on that. Only to, to add some little question and on a little idea, yeah. In, the, in, in our last project, Sahua, Sahua project, that we are researching about uh, um, socioeconomical condition of young people in in North African country. All the time we ask about what means a street in the, in the ideas of these people, yeah? And always is the same. In the street, you only learn bad things. This is the idea also that coming from the people that are living in the streets, that they are hippies and they are trying to make business and, and so on in the streets. The idea is that the streets are bad, Home and family is good. If you don't have home and family, sure that you are a bad person. This is all the time ethics and moral ideas that are in the common sense, yeah? No, I was just thinking, you know, uh, along with the discussion, the extent to which you actually uh, study who does the mediation. So, because in a sense, it would be very important the role play or the characteristics of the person who does the mediation might be really critical in terms of the success of that mediation. Mm -hmm. If the community is really what 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 you know what is involved, you know mm -hmm. what's involved in really in the in the in, in, in the judgment also mm -hmm. of the behavior of these individuals and and, and and the and the and the body or the institution that will benefit the most from 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 the resolution, then one possibility is that or one learning could be that it, it, it would need to be a person from the same community acting as, as the mediator. But then I, I think that there might be another problem, you know, could that person be objective enough uh, or to mediate between uh, two gangs that perhaps are aligned to different parts of the community? I don't know. It's, these are open questions. I know nothing about <laughs> it. And so I wonder whether actually you have uh, pursue these, uh, these uh, questions and try to, to answer them. Yeah, I, 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 and it also relates back, I think, to the point you were making previously in your comments, which is, which is you know, on, on the one hand, I say in the paper, you know, the state appropriates this idea of the public to act on behalf of the public. And I'm saying, well, no, we want to act on behalf of the community. Who is the community, right? <laughs> I mean, this is the problem. And I think that that's probably what you see ethnographically. 
you know, communities have communities have power structures. Communities have influ You know, communities have genuine equality, racism, and so on and so on. And so you, this idea of a community is this, uh, you know, the, this one homogenous lump is, is clearly not the case. I think, again, I speak from the perspective of the UK because I'm familiar with it. This tends to be how government policy works in the UK. They, the, the, the government effectively appoints a, you know, community representative. So if it's the Muslim community, they have a Muslim. And you think, well, what class? <laughs> you know, what, is, he, is he poor? Is he a millionaire? Well, he tends to be a millionaire. You know, it's a, and he speaks for you know, an impoverished community in the north of England when he's a millionaire from London. It's like, you know, so this is, tends to be what, you know, how, how this idea of community uh, get, gets constituted. Uh, I think these are constructions to an extent. They are policy constructions. But I think a lot of the questions that, that we're raising are, will have ethnographic answers. This is what I hope. You know, I think we haven't done the, the ethnographic work yet for this. And I think probably to look at these different contexts and, and, and how distinct they are and how distinct the social actors within them and who takes these roles, who becomes the kind of mediating entity. I think these are the kind of central questions to the, the, the trans gang project. I like, I like these last comments, like the perspective, maybe we can, we can give this seminar and to, to leave this, this seminar, like this discussion in mind and to keep on thinking and discussing about what is mediation, uh, what uh, brings it along, what, uh, what ethics or moralities are implied and the role of communities, individuals. So, um, uh, thank you so much for participating in this, in this very interesting session and a very, um, yeah, like a focus interest of the Transkang Research Project. And thank you for the participants here at the university <laughs> for coming. And I hope that you are interested in the next uh, Transkang seminar, which will be held in November. We will please check our website, the Transkang website, to, to confirm the date. And uh, yeah, have a really nice afternoon to all of you. Thank you.